Let's talk a little bit about marketing services and experiences. Uh, your book points out that services are a larger part of the U.S. gross domestic product than ever before. Here's a key statistic and one that might show up on the exam. Nationally, 81% of all jobs are in the services industry. 81%. In Clark County, that is where Las Vegas is located, 93% of all jobs are in services industries. And those that are non-service industries in the manufacturing industries, many of them are in the construction business. So the truth is, is that the glo nationally, we, are, we have a services-based economy. And in Clark County, this is especially true with 93% of all jobs in the service sector. Here's an, a chart from your book that talks about the service continuum, showing how offerings can vary in their balance of goods and services. So if we buy something like, uh, like salt or a necktie or clothing, um, th those are basically uh, mostly product-driven, goods-driven, um, tangible offerings, moving all the way over to uh, nursing, teaching, um, those sorts of activities which are almost all service dominated offerings uh, uh, that are intangible. Let me talk a little bit about the distinction between goods and services. To do this your book mentions the four I's of services and that is the notion that Compared to goods, services are intangible. That is, you can't touch them, you can't feel them, you can't wrap your arms around them. Services are um, uh, can't, can't be touched, felt, or held, and as a result, they're intangible. Uh, this makes the marketing of them a little bit more difficult because you can't just let people, you, the potential customer, touch and try the product. The service, uh, the service is, is intangible and therefore you, you can't actually touch it. This makes it a challenge to market that sort of product. Second distinction between goods and services is inventory. Of course, services uh, perish even if they, the product is not used. And so empty seats at a movie theater, empty seats at a restaurant, uh, unbooked time by a lawyer, and empty airline seats are all examples of, in, of services inventory that perishes whether or not someone actually experiences and uses those services or not. The third aspect of the distinction between goods and services is the inseparability between the service itself and the people who deliver that service. So for instance, let's say that you're getting a haircut. There is no way to separate the person cutting your hair from the actual haircut. They are, in fact, when you talk about getting a haircut, they are one and the same. The person who performs that service is truly part of that service, and you can't separate them from that service. And then there's the issue of inconsistency and variability and quality. One of the problems we have with services is since many services are intangible and delivered by individuals, there may be a consistency problem. So a you know so this is an example of this is you go to a restaurant one time and you get great service the next time you go to that restaurant maybe the service isn't as good uh, and that inconsistency could be due to lots of things but it is an issue that services management people have to deal with all the time the inconsistency of services. Uh, when we manage services, we talk about the seven P's. Remember that we had the four P's with, with all of marketing and with marketing goods. That is the product, the price, the place, and the promotion. The argument is that managing services adds four more uh, aspects to the services. And these are the people, the processes, productivity, and the physical goods or services. And of course, the I argument here is that we're managing when we're managing services, we have to be worried about how we manage the people. Since people are an integral part of most services, the way that we manage those people in reality is the way that we manage the delivery of the services. We also then, when we're managing services, have to, have to worry about the process. That is, how things are done. The scripts that people follow, uh, that, that, that the employees follow, and the processes that we use to deliver that service. 
Then there's the issue of productivity of services. That is, uh, you know, I've been to a grocery store and one person is checking people out very fast. And the next line, the person checking out people is much slower. So the issues about unevenness and productivity across individuals providing a service is something that managing services has to deal with. And then there's all of the physical aspects of managing a service. Uh, here we have a chart that your book uses describing the five dimensions of service quality. The five dimensions of service quality include reliability, that is the ability to perform a service as promised. The tangibles, that is the, the, the tangible aspects of a service that people can actually see to help them evaluate the service. These are things like the physical facilities, equipment, personnel, communication materials, etc. An example of this is a carpet cleaning business. If the carpet cleaning business comes to your house and they have a great big pump in the truck and they get out and they've all got crisp uniforms on and they're all clean cut and they all look like they know what they're doing, um, those are all tangible cues that suggest that this carpet cleaning company does high quality work. As opposed to a carpet cleaner who shows up in a pickup truck, he's got a, uh, a rug doctor from the local grocery store uh, and comes in and shampoos your carpet. Those, th that is an example of someone providing you with tangible cues that suggest that maybe they're not the best carpet cleaning business around. Next is responsiveness is the willingness uh, for your people to help customers and provide prompt service. The assurance that, um, that, the, that the employees exhibit in terms of their ability to get things done. And then the empathy, that is your employees caring and individualized attention provided to customers. Here we have something called uh, the, um, the traditional consumer gap uh, model where we talk about the five gaps in service quality that marketers need to be concerned with. And you can see in this chart, we have one, two, three, four, five gaps. Let's talk just very, very briefly about each gap. The, the gap that most of us are familiar with, by the way, is gap five. Uh, and so we'll get to that last. Gap one is, is the gap between customers' expectations and the organizational perceptions of customer expectations. So sometimes services that are, that are provided are not what the customer expects because the organization doesn't understand what the customer's expectations are. They think that the customer's expectations are perhaps lower um, than the customer's expectations actually are, resulting in service gaps. Second sort of gap is between the organization's perception of customer expectations and the firm's service quality specifications. So this is the, this is the distinction between an organization's perception of what customers want and the service quality specifications that it puts in in terms of the delivery of these products. So for instance, um, uh, an, an organization believes that a customer expects um, the service to be uh, executed in two days. And so they put that into the firm's quality specifications. But it turns out that the person actually um, um, wanted something different than that, wanted that product in 1.5 days. Uh, the gap between a firm's service quality specifications and the actual service quality levels. This is a gap between what what the, what the company tells its service people the quality specifications are and their people's ability to deliver those quality levels. This is a typically an operations management issue, uh, but services marketers have to deal with it. Fourth is the gap between the actual service quality levels and the external communications about the service. So this is the gap between what we're able to deliver and what we communicate that we're able to deliver. You know, we, we don't want to market ourselves as the fastest um, subway sandwich delivery service in town unless we can actually meet that service quality level. And then finally, the one that, we, that we're all familiar with is the, diff is the gap between customers' expectations and their perceptions of the service, actual service quality. So this is the gap that most of us talk about, and that is what our expectations are versus what service we think we got. We expected um, um, the, the, the food to, to be of high quality, and our perceptions of the, um, of, the, of the service was not high quality. So these are the service gaps that, that services marketing people have to deal with as they manage the quality of services over time. 
Next, we have a little chart that your book talks about in terms of the use of search experience and credence properties to evaluate services. And the argument is, th is that things that are mostly goods like clothing, jewelry, automobiles, etc., um, we can learn a lot about the quality levels by, by searching um, uh, the information that's readily available. Um, then there are products that are hard to evaluate until we actually try them. These are called high in experience properties, um, products. And then we have products that even after we experience them, we don't really know what the quality of the, of the work was and we won't know for, until some time in the future. And so we have three sorts of situations. However, it is important to point out that with online uh, social media, uh, online um, product evaluations, we now find that many people rely on online uh, recommendations and evaluations um, to pre-evaluate high experience and high credence properties. And so as the use of social media by consumers to uh, tell others about their product experiences expands, so does the use of these to evaluate all goods and services. A couple of service trends that you ought to be aware of. First off, more and more services are becoming automated. But you need to be aware of this because just because they're automated doesn't mean they're better. Uh, some services are, are online now that used to, used to, be, used to be done in person. Uh, online banking as, as opposed to face-to-face -to -face bank, banking. And then we have the famous... Um, um, uh, uh, VOP uh, uh, communications via the phone. This, these are voice um, uh, voiceover um, uh, services on the phone, and these these are the example of you call your credit card company, and there's a number of prompts, and they ask you to either say or hit a particular number. These automations, um, while reducing errors, also reduce reduce the relationships that are built between the brands and the individuals, and as a result, uh, reduce, I think, in many cases, the, the, the amount of brand loyalty that happens. Um, well, another service trend is the customization of services based on database information. The more individual level data we have about an individual, the more we're able to customize those services for that individual. Uh, and then, and, and then the, I think the third big trend is that Everyone expects good service today. Uh, everyone um, expects that service levels are going to be high, and as a result, no one is no one is surprised when they when they get good service. And in fact, in many cases, you can make the argument that services are becoming a commodity, which leads us to our next discussion, that is the one about experiences versus services.